Kia ora koutou everyone, uh, call Megan Toku Ingawa. Uh, so I sit on the Exec Committee for the NZRLA um, and today we're bringing to the third and final uni speaker series. Um, so this one is looking at job applications and putting your best foot forward. So we know some of you are in your final year or starting to think about life after uni um, and you're beginning to think about applying for jobs and um, getting your portfolio prepared and getting ready for your nerve-wracking interviews. Um, so today we've got two very experienced allies who are going to give you some inside tips on um, preparing your portfolios and what to do and not do um, in an interview. So first up, we'll hear from Tony, who's, um, for those of you who don't know Tony, he's the co-owner and director of Ruffa Mill um, in Christchurch, and they've got offices in Wanaka and Auckland as well. And as a landscape architect, has more than 25 years experience um, and his expertise span across a full spectrum of landscape architecture from designing urban streetscapes, infrastructure, commercial, ecological, residential, recreational environments to preparing assessments of landscape and visual effects. Um, then followed up by that, we will then hear from Mark Brown, who is a senior principal at Boffermas School and heads the South Island design team, which includes landscape architects and urban designers across Christchurch, Queenstown and Dunedin offices. Um, so Mark specialises in taking projects from the initial concept through to successful implementation. Um, and he has extensive experience in designing, detailing, preparing contracts and supervising the implementation of a wide range of landscape projects. So you're in good hands this evening. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to you, Tony, first up. Many, uh, many thanks, Megan, and uh, and good evening, um, everybody. I have the delight, and thank you very much, Megan, for that uh, that introduction. Um, it somewhat embellishes what I do, I think, but I'll take it. Um, uh, and so, thanks for that. Um, I'm going to speak to you guys uh, for about twenty odd minutes uh, regarding portfolios, which is quite interesting. It has made me think a little bit about portfolios and what one needs. Uh, to include in a portfolio because I'm probably in a, in a fairly lucky position in that um, I and some of you uh, listening and I imagine if you are from Lincoln University would have had me uh, tutoring um, or lecturing at Lincoln from time to time so uh, a lot of our staff uh, come to us by way of um, prior knowledge uh, rather than um, looking at a portfolio as such but we probably do get a portfolio or one or two portfolios a week almost um, from various people whether they be students or those in the profession already so um, quite familiar with what comes across um, or into the inbox um, and um, have formed my own opinion on what I do and don't like so what you hear from me now is based solely on on my my own preference which I'm sure um, or I hope others probably share across the profession but um, it is my opinion um, only and uh, you might uh, jump on websites or have others um, tell you um, otherwise or, or may differ, which is absolutely fine because it's um, relatively subjective. It's a bit like design. And when you think about it, a portfolio is very much like a, uh, a design exercise or, or certainly a graphic design exercise. So I'm just going to pull up my screen here, Megan, and let me know if you can all see that. So anyway, uh, putting your best foot forward, um, portfolios, and it's accompanied by a photo, which I'll come back to um, a little later on. Um, I've split this chat into a couple um, uh, a couple of sections. One is um, putting the portfolio together, and, and second is and the things you should think about, and the second is um, the contents of that portfolio. So if we just think about putting it together for a, for a start, uh, and we think about some of those key things, and what, what is a portfolio? And essentially, it's, it is something that you are marketing yourself. Um, you are showcasing um, your best work. Um, it's not all of your work, but it's a selection of your work. Um, it's a creative expression of you. And it's a ways of, of demonstrating um, sort of the breadth of your talent. And that talent doesn't necessarily need to just uh, be confined to landscape architecture and what you've done as a student um, in landscape architecture and in design, but um, it could be, and it should be um, much wider than that as well. Um, it provides a brief snapshot of what you can do. 
um, and I'll come back to the word brief later and snapshot, um, but I think it is important that it isn't a tome of everything you've done, um, but it is a slice um, and it's a tempter, I think, um, of what you can do. It's enough. It's a bit like when one goes fishing and you have a few nibbles on your on your hook. Um, that's what a portfolio is about. You're getting people interested rather than um, sinking them down with a, a weighty tome of information. Um, and it provides you, um, I think, a, a great chance to create a, a strong and, and dynamic first impression. So that's um, what I sort of want to, to focus on. You won't see a lot of images in my presentation of other portfolios. I've decided not to show examples as such. There's a few, few bits and pieces, but it's more things for you to think about and for you to, to generate your own ideas. No doubt you will uh, look at other portfolios as well. So some key touch points. Um, and as I said before, I want to split into to two, um, and that was engage. And that's mainly around the composition of one's portfolio. Uh, and secondly, is telling your story um, within your portfolio. So if we just think about engage and composition um, for a start, and when we engage, I'm thinking about things like the visual composition of your portfolio, um, how it is put together. Uh, the title page and introduction it sort of makes absolute sense, but that title page is, is um, king or queen. It, it needs to really grab the viewer and especially if somebody's getting this by way of, of email and I'd suggest that's not necessarily the best way to disseminate information about yourself um, but it is probably one of the most common ways at the moment and just my personal preference is um, I actually prefer a, a, a CV coming sorry not a CV a portfolio coming to me by way of PDF rather than having to click on a link that's just a personal preference um, I'm quite simple in nature, so uh, just opening a, an attached PDF is quite easy for me. Um, so a, a title page introduction, you've got to give some pretty clear thought to that. Um, when you set out the pages of your portfolio, and, and I'm sure you taught this in studio a lot about your uh, when it just comes to project work, but um, use plenty of white space and, and let your pages breathe. Um, we all have our own ideas on graphic design, um, but I'm certainly keen on, on white space and breathability around images rather than a poultice of, of information. Um, uh, keep things relatively simple. Um, and it is the little things that matter. Um, and this is a really big bugbear of mine. Um, I cannot uh, stand, and that's quite a strong stance I'm taking, I suppose, um, portfolios that have spelling mistakes in them or are grammatically not correct. Um, think about your font, your point size, um, the margins, all of those little things. Um, so, you know, it is an exercise in, in, in graphic design, but it's certainly a very important one, as, as I said before. It's, it is a chance for you to put your best foot forward um, at, at the very start uh, in, your being, you know, in your own introduction to a future uh, employer. I've just included an image here in, uh, of a title page I received on a portfolio earlier this year. Um, and it was a simply a quite a stunning photo and you only see some of it here, but it was a stunning photo of um, the Alpine or, or high, well, high country Alpine region around Wanaka. Um, and in that photo, it told me, I thought it told me quite a bit about the person. Um, it wasn't an example of their work but it was a photo of, of something in which I then found out later on in the portfolio of what they did and was a passion of theirs. Um, I found it a very engaging image and, and one that immediately made me want to sort of look through the portfolio a wee bit, uh, a wee bit more. It talked about composition and, and, and this is a condensed image and hopefully it's, uh, it's okay to see. And I'm just actually gonna do something a bit different now, so we can see that a bit better. But this was a page from a portfolio that I received a, a couple of years ago. Um, it was introducing a, a project that was being shown in the portfolio. As you can see, plenty of space around it, a simple image, uh, some simple um, details underneath in terms of the project, uh, the year, uh, supervisor, university. But what I also liked was this numbering system at the top. And so this particular portfolio had seven seven or so projects. Um, those numbers appeared at the start of each project and, and, and that particular project's number was, was highlighted or, or put in bold. Composed very nicely, I thought. Um, 
Another rule I have is, is keep things simple, but, but very effective. Um, look, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we do get lots of um, portfolios across our desk. So um, I'm drawn to, to ones that um, are quite pictorial, um, are image heavy, not jam packed full of images, but they have a priority of image over text. Um, and there is not large chunks or, or clunky text. Um, so simple and effective graphics, I think, is really important. And that's and and you need to have that graphics. I think you need to have that graphic style across or throughout your portfolio from start to to finish. And the next two pages here are just examples from a, a portfolio. And it, it was it was interesting. And I suppose my take on on this is that it was a portfolio received. I'm from a New Zealand student who had done their master's in Copenhagen. Um, certainly a quite a different feel to the portfolio than those that I would typically receive from students coming out of um, our, our three schools. Um, and in some ways, I quite like that. Um, I do find that a number of the portfolios I get are very similar from our schools. Um, and there were probably two or three reasons around that. So I think that's just an important thing to note that um, you are trying to make it look a little bit different to your peers. Um, because no doubt when you're getting to your final year, end of your final year, you're all sending things out about the same time. You know, a page that just had an image, no text, that was just a, a, a photo, a montage or, or artist impression. Um, there was enough in there to want me to sort of look further and think about it further. So composing all of graphic composition is extremely important. Um, the second part I want to talk about is what should one include in your portfolio? Um, and no doubt you've probably been talked to about this um, in your respective schools to date, but um, I've just listed some key things that are, are important from my point of view, um, and that is being yourself, uh, telling your story, do you have any involvement outside of uh, your landscape architecture um, student life? Uh, a selection of projects. Um, and then when thinking about a selection of projects, that is, to me, is the process that you've taken through those projects is key. Um, so it's not just a, a bunch of um, beautifully refined graphics. Um, yes, they are eye-catching, but I'm really, and I'm sure Mark would agree, um, I'm really interested in process. So if you um, can demonstrate in your portfolio, you know, a project from start to finish that has your hand-drawn sketches, um, it has some written text that gives you a philosophy about the project um, and your, your, your intent, um, rather than just describing the project, I think it's really important. And yes, seeing that all of those um, let's say less than polished um, drawings that have led to your final uh, image, I think is extremely important. And that spine, that pr process, process to me is, is very, very important. And I can't reiterate that enough. Um, you can teach a student or a new graduate in your office, uh, things like computer skills pretty damn quick. Um, be yourself, I think that's extremely important um, uh, in your portfolio. So you are sharing with us who you are, um, and that comes through your project work, and that has also um, that comes through the text as well, and, and what you were telling us about about yourself. And this was a colleague of mine. Um, as an office, we do quite a few events, so we decided to dress up uh, uh, for this particular one. He was most comfortable, um, and so sharing with us a little bit about your philosophy. I realise you're early on in your careers as landscape architects, just coming to the end of your student life. Um, but let us know a wee bit of, about what makes you tick and what makes you as an interesting as a person. And added to that is what you actually do outside landscape architecture. So community is very important to me. It's important to us as a practice. I'm sure it's important to um, lots of other practices as well. And, and, and Mark and, and Megan will, will agree with that. Um, so if you can demonstrate things that you do in a volunteer basis or you're a part of a community group or something similar, I think that uh, is, uh, is fantastic. Uh, 
because as a uh, you know as a practice we get involved in such things and it, and it's good to have a workforce that um, is keen to get in behind that in terms of your projects and i mentioned this earlier um, it's quality over quantity so it's projects that pack a punch or that's how i call it so you know select your best ones or, or the ones that you think are going to best demonstrate your understanding of the design process or those that have um, taken you along a really interesting design process. And sometimes your results on those projects may not be as great as some of your or good as some of your others, but you actually demonstrate a really good process. Um, so seeing hand drawn sketches um, and bits and pieces for a start is, is, is excellent rather than just refined and polished graphics. And in this case here, this particular CV I got, um, you know, there was a photograph of, of the gentleman and his, uh, his work colleague looking at models they'd made. Um, and then the subsequent pages in the portfolio. Um, and this was a, a, a young graduate in a larger firm in Copenhagen. And the subsequent pages showed the built, um, the built project, which was a, a memorial to those killed in, um, in the island shootings um, off Oslo a number of years ago. And, um, but the majority of the work shown in the portfolio was actually the process to get to the end point. And I've just got a couple of pages to share with you of that same portfolio showing um, process, keeping text to a minimum, but um, succinct and clear And so that, uh, and I just quickly flick through those, through those because they were just examples of, of one person's work. Um, but to me, they, they demonstrated a very clear um, process. Um, I do get a lot of portfolios that uh, are linked to the NZI LA core competencies. Um, and uh, there are good ways and bad, bad ways of doing that, I suppose. Um, and also only do this if you are au fait with them um, and they, um, do have or are applicable to your particular projects. Um, no way do you want to appear contrived and, and trying too hard. Um, if I can say that, um, I uh, uh, where well you can though, do it um, and, and, and where it's beneficial. In this particular one here, um, the comp competencies were listed early on in the portfolio and were given each given a number. And then that number was applied to the particular project example in the portfolio. So quite a neat and handy way of doing that. And this particular person um, certainly understood those core competencies pretty well. Uh, I mentioned a CV and cover letter earlier, and it's certainly important to, to include those um, in your portfolio. Um, the key thing with cover letter though, and probably one of the things that bugs me most is you get a lot of generic cover letters. Um, and I can understand why you do, because if you're sending out your portfolio to many people, you might just do that, but it doesn't resonate when perhaps you've got the person's name wrong or they're in fact the company name wrong on this. So make sure you get those little things right. So research who you're sending it to um, and perhaps tailor that letter to that person, to that firm as well. Actually, I shouldn't word, use the word perhaps, I'd say tailor that um, letter or tailor your approach. Um, no need for an overly formal letter, I don't believe. It should be bright. Um, I've used the word breezy. Maybe that's a little bit flippant, but it sh should certainly be fresh and sort of energetic. Um, it's a letter that I want to read and, and I'm sort of uplifted and I, I, you know, my curiosity is piqued by this person who's, who's sent this through to me rather than reading it and going, ah, oh, yes, here goes another one. I'll put that in the respond to shortly file rather than I must get onto that straight away. Um, and I do respond to everybody's portfolios when they do send them through and CVs. Um, and with your CV, once again, keep it nice and nice and short and tight, but keep it clear. And 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 it comes back to that telling your story. Make sure that you know you do tell your story in your CV beyond just what you've perhaps achieved in marks at at university. Um, share any awards or any post curricular or extracurricular things that you've done as well. You might like fishing, perhaps. And then just to finish off with is um, follow up. I pay little attention um, to cold call um, portfolios that just arrive uh, in my inbox, even though I just said before I do follow up on all of them. I do pay more attention to those 
that um, have phoned ahead or follow up with a phone call. And so um, please do that. I think it's essential that you do that. Um, your mark will agree with this. You remember those people that do that rather than just having something that's arrived in your inbox. Um, so I think it's really important for all of you that you, know, you are going that little bit further. You are making that effort. Um, you are making that, um, hopefully, that difference with the prospective uh, employer. So there goes probably my 20 minutes plus a few more minutes. Um, and that's a quick snapshot of portfolios from my point of view. So happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you. Great, thanks Tony. That was um, some good food for thought, I think, for the students. Um, so we'll just hand over to Mark now, who's gonna run through some uh, tips for interviewing. Cool, thanks um, uh, Megan, and, and thanks Tony. It's uh, really interesting to hear you talk about um, a range of those things and um, the, this is some um, very similar themes and things that crop up in relation to interviews as well. Mine's not probably quite as long, um, uh, which will work out well for the, uh, the questions at the end. Um, there's not as much graphic stuff to go with an interview, I guess. So um, just thought I'd run through, uh, I guess, a few things um, that I've been thinking about and actually talking to a few of the people in, um, in the office in Christchurch a couple of days ago as well about the sorts of things that it's important to do, um, given that uh, a number of them have actually been, I guess, uh, interviewees as opposed to, to me interviewing um, um, quite a bit um, recently. So um, it's been good to have a bit of a chat to those guys and just get their thoughts, which I think will be useful as well. So breaking it down, I guess, into five um, main areas uh, for things that you can think about when you are um, going uh, to an interview. And the first one is, is to be prepared. And um, the old scout motto of being prepared uh, certainly rings true with us. And some really simple things, but things to just think about um, to make your time easier when you do go in um, and speak to some people. So make sure you're on time is key. And I guess in the moment um, that, that means either in the virtual world or, um, or, or going to somebody's office or, or to another location to meet, um, meet some people. Um, dress appropriately. Landscape architects generally, I think, have a, a fairly sort of casual, um, smart casual approach to, to work. As you can see, I'm in a t-shirt today, um, which is entirely appropriate. But I guess it's just around um, making sure that you um, uh, are presenting yourself as, as well as possible. That probably uh, means not going in too formally. I wouldn't say a suit's the right way to go. But you know, make sure that you're um, you're, you're you're dressed well, um, and and that means, I guess, incorporating whatever your sense of fashion or style is. Um, but yeah, just making sure that you're um, nice and presentable. Um, uh, linking into what Tony's just spoken about, um, bring a copy of your portfolio and your CV with you. So if you're going to see some um, people in person, print print a good copy out, print your, your portfolio in A3 if that's the way it is and, and take your CV along as well. It's good to have those things. Um, there's the possibility that the people who are interviewing you may not have printed it out or may not have a computer with them. Um, um, so don't, I guess, rely on them to be organised with that. Also helps that if you would like to refer to, um, you know, a potentially question that you're asked where you could um, give an example by showing, say, a project or something that you've worked on within your, your portfolio, that really helps. Um, given um, the state of the world um, at the moment, um, a lot of interviews are, and, and meetings are conducted on, on Zoom or on Teams. Um, I know at Boffers we use Teams pretty pretty consistently and, um, and Zoom sometimes as well. Um, and that creates a few different challenges in terms of um, uh, speaking to people. So really suggest doing a dry run first, even if that means just um, making a, a, a maybe a mock sort of a, a interview with somebody that you, you trust in terms of being able to ask you a couple of questions but also to, to set things up and make sure that things are working properly. So sound, camera, light, all that sort of stuff um, and, and being able to share things as well. So for instance, sharing your portfolio, portfolio on screen, being able to um, um, do those things well. And then the last thing I've got with that is think about your background. And that's probably not um, related to your lineage as such, but more around um, um, what you've got behind you. So make sure that it's something um, that looks reasonably okay, like a brick wall, but possibly not a coat stand. Um, 
And if you need to, like if you're in your, you know, say you're in the bedroom of a flat or something like that, or a space that's not great, maybe think about using some of those filters and things as well, as we've all gotten used to. Um, the next one is, I guess, when you arrive and you're you're in the interview, be attentive and, and be interested. Um, I guess the first thing with that is be enthusiastic and engaged. So um, it helps to appear to be, you know, up for it and and, and wanting to um, to work at the particular place or organisation that you're being organised by. Um, that's sometimes challenging because not everybody's, you know, fully extro extroverted or um, um, has that type of personality. But it's about, I guess, being um, paying attention, um, making sure that you're listening as much as possible um, and, and, and answering things well um, and, and presenting yourself in a way that, that shows that you're enthusiastic about potentially working at that, um, that organisation. Let's close. The uh, next one is, is really closely tied to what um, uh, Tony was talking about before in terms of doing some research um, on the organisation or the company that is interviewing you, it's not a great idea to go in cold without not knowing anything about them. And presumably, if you want to work at that particular place, you, you should know or, or want to understand a little bit about them. So that's, that's relatively easy now because most places have websites. So you're able to go and have a look at the, the sorts of things that are on there. So um, have a look at that. Have a look at um, the key things that they talk about. What are the projects that they do? How do they organise themselves? Who works there? Um, what are other? What are some of the elements that uh, other elements that they they incorporate into into their um, into their their workplace? Um, yeah, and a, a key one with that is is really about finding out what projects the organisation has done. That may help you when you're speaking or answering questions. If you're able to talk about something that interests you, or you've done previously. That links into something that company has done so you're able to show i guess some um some connection to that or some ability or experience in the same realm the same sorts of things that the, the organization does and then another thing which you might be able to do it's not always known who you'll actually be talking to but um it's one of the things that you potentially could do when um you're invited to an interview is ask ask who's interviewing you Again, with um, uh, the internet and particularly LinkedIn, which a lot of people are on, it's not too hard to find out about um, who people are and just get a steer on the sorts of things that they've done before. What have they worked on? Um, what are the sorts of things that interest them? So it's sort of a little bit of that knowledge is power thing and understanding um, who you're talking to in the first instance. And I think that Tony sort of brought that up as well when you're presenting a portfolio or a cover letter, find out about the people beforehand um, and understand um, who your audience is and who you're speaking to. Uh, the next part during the interview, I guess, is be calm um, with the image. It's um, not like you're shooting off to a despot nation and speaking to the, 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 the dictator of that place. Um, the people that you're talking to want to talk to you um, and they want to find out about as much about you as possible. Um, and if you've made it that far, there's a reason they want to talk to you. So, so be confident with that and, and I guess take some, take some calmness out of that. Um, the, I guess the interviewers may want to test you and they probably will want to test you on some elements about what you actually do. So potentially something that will help you with that is to, to think of some scenarios first and maybe play those out with some people that you trust, some colleagues, some friends, some, you know, people that you study with. Um, and, and, um, and think about a few things or an answers to um, some, some, maybe some more challenging questions. Um, a couple that um, often come up in interviews that I've been involved with are, are, are how you've responded to a difficult situation. Um, Organisations and workplaces such as ours, I'm sure, um, Boffin Muscle, I'm sure it's the same at Rough and Mill, like to understand how you, you react in certain situations. So they'll be interested in hearing about if you've had a challenging situation, say designing something or on site with a contractor or in a hearing or, or doing those sorts of things um, as to how you responded in a certain, certain situation. Another one is um, uh, what would you say is your main weakness? So it's sort of not actually finding out about the things that you do well. It's trying to understand the things that um, 
you may be not so good at and trying to understand those as well. So that's a good thing to think about as well, I think, um, in terms of what you might talk about and whether you can spin that into a positive. Um, and it might be around, you know, cheekily saying you work too hard or, you know, you too tell too many jokes or something like that. But um, having something that is um, that you've identified and thought about before and, and have a good answer around how you might be working on that or developing something, something that you're learning on is, is a good thing to think about as well. Um, take your time to answer. Don't rush in. Don't, um, don't feel, I guess, pressured to talk immediately um, and try and avoid rambling, uh, I guess. Um, don't be afraid to take a pause and, you know, pause for five, 10 seconds just to think about something and, and um, put some thoughts together in your head. And, and I guess um, attached to that is, is don't be afraid to defer either. If you can't think of the answer to something um, immediately, perhaps ask and say, can I come back to that question? And perhaps you could answer it after you've talked about a few other things. Um, I think that's a much better approach than, than trying to make up something um, or um, trying to, um, you know, ramble through something. So I think that's a, a better way of doing that. And, and it shows um, the people that you're talking to as well um, that you um, are, are considered and that you're, you're not too afraid to take your time and actually come up with a decent response rather than trying to bluff through. Um, be ready to talk about you. Um, and we've got our man saying, I am great. Um, this, is, this is really your time to shine. And Tony alluded to that as well in terms of your portfolio. It's about showing you know, the things that you're really good at and cherry picking some of those great things while um, I guess showing your ability to do things through stages as well in a portfolio. But this is an element um, that is actually quite challenging I find, particularly with new um, uh, graduates, people coming out of university are fairly young in their career and um, generally a trait of New Zealanders as such where we're not too willing to blow around trumpets um, and talk about the things that we're good at um, and even um, sort of diverge to talking about the things that we're not so good at um, more than the other, uh, the, the, the positive things. Um, so be ready to talk about you and be ready to talk about the things that you are good at and, um, and, and the things that excite you and the things that you're interested in and the things that you want to improve in. And, you know, an interview is really a chance to promote your, your ability and um, your personality as well. Um, yeah, talk about the parts of the profession that interest you. And that relates back to finding out a little bit about um, the, the organisation that you're, you're interviewing with and finding out what they do and seeing where the links are. So what are the sorts of projects that we're working on? What are the parts of the, pro, um, you know, the parts of that business or, or, or that organisation that interest you? And, um, and the sorts of work that interest you, is there a link there? Um, yeah, relate your potential, and, and that uh, relates to the next comment as well, relating your professional interest to the organisation reviewing you. So understand what they do is really, really key so that you're able to show that you're enthusiastic about the type of, of work that they do. A key part, um, and, and Tony alluded to this as well, so it's quite nice that um, there's, there's a couple of um, um, things that really match up in, the, in both of the talks that we've, we've done. Um, talk about your other experience. So illustrate the sorts of things that you've done, particularly if you're new in the profession or you're coming out of university. There is an amount you will know about, um, about landscape architecture, but there's a whole lot of other things that you've done as well. And particularly for graduates or sort of recent um, professional level um, um, people when we're looking to interview, we're wanting to understand the other things that they've done. So have you traveled? What's the other work that you've done? What did you do at school? What were you into? What were your other achievements? You know, what did you have to work to to get to that achievement? So, so understanding those sorts of things, um, it's it's key to talk about those things because we're often looking for um, not only the ability to do the work, but the personality and also their ability to fit into a team, um, and and generally just be a, um, a a good egg to a certain extent. Um, understanding that. So it's really key to understand, or, and if you've got um, experience of workplace, like a lot of people do um, through high school, university and retail or in hospitality or those sorts of things, 
let people know about that. Let the interviewers know about that because it's important to understand that you might have had some front facing and dealing with the public, client, those sorts of things. Um, uh, so yeah, I'd really encourage you um, in an interview, interview to, to be able to talk about those sorts of sorts of things. And the last one is, is more around towards, I guess, what comes at the end of an interview. Um, let's be inquisitive. Have some questions ready. Um, be ready to ask some things of the interviewers about them potentially, about the, uh, the organisation. Um, it's um, something that we certainly look for in people that we're speaking to. We want to um, we want them to question us because it shows that they're interested and it shows that they've been thinking about um, um, Boff Miskell, for instance, um, and and wanting to understand the sort of work that we do. Um, so ask about the organisation. Ask about the things that you do, or if you've seen something on the website that isn't completely clear, or you know why that project happened, or or those sorts of things. Ask about that. Ask about the role that you're going for. Um, uh, you know, a role description can only tell so much. Ask about the sorts of things you'll be doing. Ask about um, the types of software you'll be using. Ask about the tasks that you'll be under, asked to undertake. So, so really have a think about those things. And it's also a key opportunity to ask about remuneration and benefits. So the sorts of things that you'll get for doing the work. Now, I know that um, that seems like an upfront thing to do. Um, and in the first instance, particularly if you're um, looking to try and get your first or your second job, you're, you're more interested in trying to get the job um, and worrying about some of those th things, uh, um, I guess, as a secondary type of um, thing. But um, I guess I find it refreshing when people actually ask about that, because um, if we find that you're the right person, but our um, understanding of what your salary expectations might be, for instance, are completely poles apart. It's not much use not having that, that knowledge. So um, if you're not asked about that, ask the question of the people that you're talking to, say, you know, what's that role? It'll, or uh, what, what's the likely salary or wage for this, this position? It, um, it, it helps, I guess, to show that um, you're interested and keen, but it also helps um, gain an understanding of your level of expectation for that as well. Uh, so that's mine. Good luck when you have some interviews. Thanks, Mark. That was really interesting. So the first question is, do you feel grouping projects into skill sets is one way to bring a portfolio together instead of project to project? Um, I'll, I'll answer first, and I'm sure Mark will have, have an answer too. And we may both differ. Um, I don't necessarily see that uh, as something that I look forward to or, or, or require when I look at a portfolio. I'm happy to look at it from project to project. Um, if your skill sets are quite diverse, i.e. you have um, some landscape planning uh, experience from at university and, and, and work you want to showcase, I then suggest perhaps putting design and planning or, or keeping them sort of, you know, divided within your portfolio rather than sort of mixing them up. Um, but overall design, I'd, I'd just roll project to project myself. Yeah, I'd ag agree with that. I think, um, as you mentioned earlier, Tony, it's about showing the process, I think, more that you've been through through that uh, that particular project and showing the things that you've done on that. And, and I think a really key part that you mentioned before, Tony, was around showing the breadth of how you've worked through that. So it's not just the sexy drawing at the end, it's the, you know, the, the rubbish crappy sketch that was the key to unlocking it all as, as, as important as, um, as the, the final document. Yep. Second question is, how long do you wait to sending a portfolio before a follow-up call? 75 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, um, Look, I, uh, my rule of thumb is I, I try and reply to people within within a week. Um, I uh, rule of thumb and Mark, I'd be interested to know what you guys are and me and what you guys do at Popper. We we have a rule of thumb. We reply to emails within a uh, try and reply to emails within a day. Um, if I've got portfolio replies, I tend to I make sure I do that within a week. Uh, if I'm getting a portfolio from somebody, I'd expect them to have called me within that week. Yeah. 
Um, pretty similar, trying to respond within a day to let them know what the process is. Um, uh, if there is a process around it, if it's an, an interview type thing, that's actually generally handled by our, um, our HR people, which is, is good. But if it's if somebody sending in a portfolio, we'll say let them know within a day. And then, you know, it's generally a week is a good amount of time because it's fresh enough. But if it gets any further beyond that, it's sort of, it's not fresh at all anymore and it's easy to forget. Yeah. Exactly. And I think probably on a typical day, I'm probably getting somewhere between 120 and 150 emails. So, um, and I'm sure you guys are similar. So, you know, in those realms. So, there's a, a bit to wade through. Um, so, a week makes us, or as Mark says, keeps it fresh in our mind. Yeah. Then, with that question, I'm not sure if a component of the question was um, whether or not the person should follow up with a call as well. That's often not a bad idea. If you haven't heard anything, maybe after sort of two or three days, then then do that. Um, and it's a it's a good reminder as well to the people that might be looking at it. Um, I'm just going to add to that question: How long do you think you should wait after you've been interviewed to call and follow up? Yeah, look, I, I probably, um, we, we let, uh, I, if you haven't heard uh, within, a, within a week, fine, you'd certainly ring to follow up. Um, and I'm sure you guys, uh, we, we, would, we would come back to interviewees pretty damn quickly after an interview. Yeah. Um, uh, sometimes it's a wee bit challenging because there might be sort of other external factors working in an interview yeah. progress that, that hold things up. Um, but generally, we try and give the people that we're interviewing a steer at the end of the interview as to when they will they will know, so you don't have to worry too much about it and sort of sit there hanging. But if you're given a time frame and you don't hear, by by all means, I would be following up um, once that time frame expires. But yeah, you know, generally it's it's as as quick as possible because that's just best for everybody, basically. Yeah, yeah, and and certainly on that, if we are sorry, if we're getting. Um, um, what are we getting? Applications from jobs uh, that we've advertised. Um, we would tend to let that applicant know that we've received something, you know, within the day, we'd, we'd let them know and they just advise them of what the process is. Yeah. Um, another question here, do you feel it's best to have multiple portfolios on hand? What variances do you see would help? Connection to place comes to mind. Applying for work, say, in Auckland could highlight projects based in Auckland compared to Christchurch projects. Yeah, certainly. I wouldn't have multiple on, on hand. I think what we can do these days is have a portfolio that's easy to sort of update or interchange with, with project work. Um, so I wouldn't have a, a huge amount sitting there. I just have the one that's easy to yeah, have it sitting in InDesign or something. Um, and um, yes, but it comes back to the, the process thing that uh, both Mark and I have touched on and we're really interested in, and in, in irrespective of where your project is, um, if you are demonstrating good pro, uh, process, then that's what I'm really interested in. Yeah. But but certainly if, if, you know, if it's Auckland and we've said in our advert that, you know, we, we want to show some experience in the far north or Auckland or somewhere, then yes, by all means, put in a couple of projects that demonstrates that. But it comes back to process irrespective of where your project is. Yeah, I, I would I'd go down the track of having multiple portfolios. I think if you have one master that you just pull bits and pieces out of rather than trying to add bits in as the way to, to go, or you'll be doing it forever. <laughs> yeah. 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 Cool. Um, do your firms generally advertise positions for internships for graduate students or do you just respond to people who contact you? Yep, we're pretty loose. Uh, we, we respond to people that um, contact us. And as I said at the very start of my chat, um, I'm quite lucky in that by doing a wee bit of teaching at Lincoln, I do tend to also, um, I don't know, perhaps suggest to people that they contact us. We, um, we get a mix, so we do get people um, just asking, which is fine, and we understand that um, um, because it's a component of what's needed at the study for, for Lincoln, and in particular in terms of the practical work experience, um, which I'm more familiar with than, than the others. But um, um, we also have a scholarship that we run through Lincoln as well that includes um, part of that as an internship. So I think there's for third year um, people that might be at Lincoln and listening into this, um, if you're going into third year next year or you haven't already, there is something that you can actually apply for. So that's something worth considering as well. Yeah. I guess again for the internships, like don't be afraid to contact 
um, firms to ask if they do have an internship available, because you might just get them on a day where they actually suddenly need someone in who, you know, you know, they've got a project that's come on onto the um, system and they need some help with um, producing some bits and pieces. So yeah, definitely keep trying. Um, so someone said, thank you for the valuable information. If an architect urban designer is coming from outside New Zealand, what skills should they upgrade before applying for a job in New Zealand? Do architectural firms consider applicants from such applicants, applications from such applicants? Oh, I can certainly speak from landscape architecture and yes, we do. Um, and I don't necessarily need them to upgrade any skills. Um, essentially, it's, it's quite simple for me. Um, if if they're demonstrating that they're top-notch designers or and the like, then um, yep. don't need to upgrade. Uh, the, yeah, I, I'd agree with that. The the biggest thing is um, is and the biggest challenge, I guess, for people potentially coming from overseas to New Zealand to to do work is the slightly different context that we have here. But you can only obviously learn that by being here and working mm. here. So, yeah, those yep. as long as you can again show what you can do. <laughs> show the process, then and that's the most important thing. Um, so another one here, where are most jobs advertised? What portion of new hires are from people just sending in their portfolio cold or is hiring only respond as only to respondents to ads? So I guess I'll just quickly make a plug for the NZRLA here that majority of jobs are advertised on the NZRLA website. Um, and as students, you should be getting um, the alerts when a new job comes out. Um, so it does pay to look on there and I guess just your, your standard trade me and seek as well is probably another good one just to follow up. But majority of firms will advertise through the NZLA website. Yep, I agree with you, Megan. That's what we do. Um, we have put one on Seek uh, previously, um, but um, and I'm not sure whether it's right or wrong as a practice for us, but we probably um, hire 90% of any new staff uh, not by way of advert. Mm -hmm. So pro probably only 10% of our new staff come from advertising. Um, it's more a case of um, employing when we need and, and and maybe after being approached, if that sort of coincides is when we need some help. Mm. So that's that's our own, and, I, and I'm sure that's probably atypical. Um, but once again, it also comes back to our position of um, having done, been involved in a bit of education. And then and then through that, you actually get a, a bit of network of, of LAs that do just keep in touch with you. Yeah. So um, that's how we, yeah. Um, yeah, ours is probably a mix of the two. Um, yep. And I would suggest that um, when the, the further you move through your career, um, the less it kind of becomes about um, uh, um, answering a job advert. It's more around um, making connections and, and talking to people, and, and that often people will get nabbed before it, you know, something gets anywhere near market or, or yep. a, um, advert. Yeah. Yep. And also, generally, like when um, you know a company decides to that they do want to hire someone, even, you know, someone at a grad level. The first question that often goes around the office is, does anyone know of anyone? Um, and especially for grads, one way that you can get yourself known is by putting yourself out there and attending things like branch events. Um, they are all held within the regions and um, they're a great way to broaden your network of, um, get just your network and get yourself in front of people in the profession as well so that when they do come to needing to hire someone they're like oh I remember so and so they were you know they, they were great they approached me they were really confident um let's bring them in and have a chat with them um, so yeah networking goes quite a long way um as well as you know the standard uh system of applying for a job through um an ad um, so someone else said, as a student, how would you recommend approaching a firm to express interest in future employment? Um, I, I always like um, a phone call. I might be a bit old fashioned around that, but um, I, I, I like I do like that sort of personal approach. Um, I actually even don't mind somebody walking in off the street. I know it can be a big ask to do sometimes, but um, it's also quite refreshing. Um, that is my, I mean, look, I know 90% of the approaches are by, by electronic, um, but 
I do prefer and I do like that um, that phone call. Yeah, I'd suggest a phone call is, is um, a, a good way of getting somebody's attention first up and, and being able to have a chat because it shows some initiative. Um, like I, I, I wouldn't recommend just cold emailing a portfolio and a letter like that because that's very, very easy to um, ignore and, um, and dismiss to a certain extent. It's a little bit more challenging um, if you've had a bit of contact with somebody and, and they've, they've talked about you. And yeah, um, as Megan was saying before, find opportunities to, to talk to people, go to things, um, go to industry events. If you're you know, heading into your last year of university, have your, have your feelers out for the sorts of things that the Institute might be putting on and have a think about some of the other things that um, you know, conferences or other events that, that um, prospective employers might be going to. So another question here, any suggestions about referees? So I'm guessing they're asking kind of, yeah, who, who to use as referees? Yeah, look, as a student, um, we, look, to be perfectly frank, very rarely follow up on referees from, from when we're employing graduates. Um, and um, if they are using referees, I you know, if somebody's got a, a lecturer or a tutor, um, a sports coach or something that they've done in the community, um, mm. by all means, use those. Yeah, that's a pretty challenging one. If you've not done any work before, it's sort of there's only so much validity you can get. And yeah, as Tony says, yep, if you've got a you know lecturer or a tutor that you've worked pretty closely with, that's a good idea. But um, it wouldn't, it's not the be all and end all, I suspect, yeah. first, first time out. Yeah. And also, the, um, within each region, generally, everyone's got some sort of connection to people kind of working at the universities as well. So sometimes what does happen is, you know, you get someone's CV and you interview them, and it might just be a casual chat to someone at the uni being like, oh, do you, do you know so-and-so? Um, what do you think of them or something? Or, you know, we're looking to hire a graduate, give us your top five students or something. So, um yeah, again, it's just where we are a small profession and everyone does know everyone. So, um, yeah, it's very easy to get known in, in, in the profession, which is good. Um, right, that's all the questions at the moment. I don't, um, I'll just give another yell out if there's any more burning questions um, to come through and then otherwise we'll just wrap it up. <clears throat> I think the uh, other two, everyone else, if anyone was hiring, so <laughs> I'm surprised it hasn't come up in this one, given the uh, time. Oh, everybody's busy at the moment. So. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's one good thing for you guys coming out of uni is uh, it's probably the most amount of jobs I've ever seen advertised at the moment and yeah. regularly advertised. Um, there's a lot of work on at the moment. And a lot of people are hiring. So, yeah. Put yourself out there in any way that you can and um, I'm sure it'll yeah come about for you and pay off. Um, perfect well there's nothing else that's come through so I might just wrap up so um, yeah thanks everyone um, for attending and for those that have um, joined in for the three series as well. Um, Hopefully it's kind of given you a bit of an insight into uh, where you can end up as a landscape architect and how to get there as well from transitioning from uni to um, the profession. Um, and a big thanks to Tony and Mark tonight for um, taking time out to present. Um, and also Katrina from the NZLA, our event manager for helping set all this up. So um, yeah, thanks everyone and good luck for your uh, final year or final few years um, and for your exams. I'm sure they're coming up pretty soon. Um, so yeah, have a good evening, everyone.